All right, Cynthia, whenever you're ready. So good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cynthia Baker. I'm the executive director of Kazan, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar today uh, titled Violence in Nursing Education, Promoting Respectful Interactions. We are presenting this, uh, this webinar in response to conversations regarding the horizontal and the vertical bullying and, and disrespect that has been happening uh, in nursing education. Over 380 people have registered for this webinar. So it really it appears to be uh, an issue of importance, an issue of concern across, across the country. Before proceeding, I would like to respectfully acknowledge uh, that the Kazan National Office is situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. Attendees to this webinar are from across Canada, uh, so we respect and, infer, and affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous people across the land. I will now invite Jessica to provide an overview of the webinar. Jessica. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I would also like to extend my welcome to the participants in this webinar today. Your presence today is a great indicator that there is energy in nursing education to end violence and bullying. Um, because of the very large number of attendees, we, will, we have removed participant audio and video we will wait until all three presentations are done before taking questions, and we will not be taking oral questions, but you can put your questions in the chat, uh, and I see a lot of people are already using the chat, which is wonderful, um, and then we'll address them as after the presentations have completed. So please note that the webinar portion of today's session will be recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, within the week. The recording will not include the workshop half of the session, and the PowerPoint slides from the presenters will not be made available, but you'll be able to see them on the YouTube slide or the YouTube video. So today I will be co-facilitating with my colleague, Don Flaming, and he uh, will greet you now. Good morning and welcome. Uh, just hearing, uh, just wanted to hear in today's discussions may, may cause you some emotional stress because you may remember or re perhaps re-experience some violence that has occurred to you. So we're just saying, if this happens, please avail yourself of the appropriate services at either your institution or in the community. Thanks very much, Don. So our first presenter today is Kathy O'Flynn McGee, an Associate Professor of Teaching Emeritus at the University of British Columbia. And you can refer to the webinar webpage uh, for her full bio. Her presentation is entitled Violence in Nursing Education, Promoting Respectful Interactions Between Students and Faculty. And over to you, Kathy. You can start, Kathy, if you, uh, oh, if you okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Jessica and Don, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I'm Kathy O'Flynn McGee, and I am, as Jessica has indicated, um, an Associate Professor Emeritus from UBC School of Nursing. I have been working with this concept of bullying, addressing bullying, for the last five or six years. So I'm really pleased to have been invited just to say a, a couple of words about, um, about that in relation to promoting respectful relationships with students, between students and faculty. I think what I wanted to say today is that probably one of the most important things and ways we can promote those relationships is by preventing and addressing and eradicating bullying in nursing education. It's very rampant. There are many different terms used for it. I'm using the term bullying um, for a variety of reasons. There's a lot of confusion out there in the literature about um, what might constitute bullying, um, incivility, uh, lateral violence, horizontal violence, etc. So um, we're using the term bullying just to be clear, but know that 
that is sometimes interchangeable or there are different meanings out there. Or most importantly, I think um, there are two uh, controversies in the literature about bullying. And one is that uh, in terms of conceptualizing it, one is that bullying must be intentional versus not intentional. And the other is that bullying must be uh, ongoing, a pattern of behavior versus a single incident. And so I will share the sort of definition that we've been using in our work, um, but we're using it because it allows us to say it can be an intentional or not intentional. It can be a pattern of behavior or a single incident can constitute bullying, we would say. And so we're looking at bullying of students and just a little bit bullying by students, because I know for the audience today that's probably you know really interesting as well but my work and our team's work has been on bullying of students. Kathy can I just uh quickly interrupt you for a moment oh you've done it already I <laughs> perfect sorry just to switch to presenter view. Thank you so bullying experienced by students it's extremely rampant and uh, T, Stephen T and, and colleagues in the United Kingdom did a study reported in 2016 where 42% of their over 600 uh, participants had experienced bullying. Um, another, another study um, that looked at comparing the UK and Australia in terms of undergraduate students' experience with bullying, in the UK it was 35% and in Australia 50%. So these numbers are quite high, but the numbers in Canada, if you can believe it, are even higher. And so in 2012, it's quite a long time ago, Clark um, did a study where 88% of nursing students had experienced bullying. I mean, that is just a wild figure. And much more recently in Eastern Canada, Macdonald et al reported 70% of their 260 participants had experienced bullying. So bullying is rampant. It's very, very prevalent. And so I think the question that we need to be really thinking about, what are we going to do about it? So just a very brief uh, little word about upwards bullying, contra power harassment. So this is bullying by students of faculty, and it is getting more um, recognition in the literature. Um, and so this study by Christensen, I've had horrible things said about me, an inductive content analysis of nursing academic experiences of contra power harassment, uh, indicated, as have others in this area, that a lot of the bullying that happens that is experienced by faculty from students is often related to assessment, evaluation, and grade sharing. And that really doesn't surprise me because that's a very tense, a very tense time. And so uh, some students' behaviors in this study left the faculty reeling in disbelief as to what those behaviors were. I do not agree with the mark, one student said. I've looked at other papers and they were marked right. And another comment about the grading. You need to remark my paper. I did answer the question. You just didn't read it properly. And so these are examples of the ways in which faculty felt bullied by students when they got their marks and they were questioning them in ways that were not very respectful, for sure. And so um, Marie Hutchinson in Australia has done a lot of work about the organizational content of bullying. And uh, she says very rightly, I would absolutely agree, I'm imagining many would. It's not really possible to understand bullying without giving some consideration to the concept of power. Power is huge in bullying interactions. And, and a lot of people talk about the imbalance of power so that one has more power than the other. And as you all know, uh, power is viewed by different theorists in different ways, but just to say here today that um, it is a very important aspect of bullying. And when we think about power, I think we have to think about the players. Um, the players are really key. You have the individual who engages in bullying. You have the target. I prefer that word. Judith MacDonald suggested using that word instead of victim. And I like the word target much better. It's very, it's, it's very, um, concise and I think um, yeah I think there's a lot more being written now about the witness the bystander the upstander and those different terms are used to try to indicate that um, bystanders can actually take quite an active role and can 
be a real part of the engagement and the interaction. They might be the very first person who is there to actually witness what is going on. And so they're very, very key. And of course, no surprise, leaders are key. And uh, a lot of the literature will talk about and um, it's really up to leaders to set the tone and to ensure that we move towards the goal that I've talked about, preventing, addressing and eradicating bullying. But uh, often bullying is viewed as an interpersonal um, between two people, personality of somebody, oh, that's just the way they are. But that doesn't really allow for the idea of context and how important everything that's going on around people is equally important. And uh, many of you will know the work of uh, Hartrick, Doan and, and Varco, who have written a couple of books about relational inquiry. And really I've learned a lot from their work in that they talk about the intra, inter and contextual levels. The intra being what's going on within all of us who are here, what's going on between all of us who are involved and what's going on around all of us. And so that's really helpful. Another way of thinking about it is to think about the context as cultural, socio-political, institutional and historical. And uh, I would say that one of the, just to give an example of a socio-political context that influences um, this kind of behavior between faculty and students would be this, this corporatization of the academic, the, acad the academy. And the fact that we're very much moving towards uh, outputs and students are thinking that they are looking for a service and faculty are considered to be the service givers and it can change the relationships very much within the university. Also the stress that students en encounter and faculty encounter does play quite a large role in this uh, prevalence of, of bullying. Okay, so what to do is always the question. Okay, so what? Uh, I think first of all, don't do nothing, do something. And in our work, we have really, found that to be very important do something there's so much under reporting there's so much silence around bullying and it doesn't help to move us on in that way be clear about what constitutes bullying if we don't know what we're talking about it's very hard to address it to prevent it uh, to eradicate it and so um, just as an example we use worksafe bc from um, which is our legislative definition of bullying and harassment and it works well because it's quite broad and it also works well for students and so it's really about um, inappropriate conduct or a comment that a person would make towards a student that the person knew or should excuse me should have known would cause that student to be humiliated or intimidated and so um, this is not the be and end all but it's something we have found extraordinarily helpful to say this is how we are understanding bullying. Also key I think in terms of what to do for each and every one of us whether we're in a leadership role, formal or informal, an educator role, a research role, but we need to be reflecting on our beliefs and our values and the theoretical underpinnings, especially as they relate to the relationships we have with students that's really key. And I just mention a few here that I have found extremely helpful in helping me to promote respectful engagement with students. And of course, uh, you'll all be familiar with Paolo Freire, the founder of critical pedagogy and anti-oppression, action-oriented social justice, um, very key figure in some of my approaches. And then Bell Hooks, who, who, who talked about the pedagogy of freedom and the pedagogy of engagement. So the idea of having relationships with students where everybody's voice was heard was really key. Uh, socially just pedagogy is something that I've only just come across fairly recently, but Osman and Hornsby are, uh, you know, inviting us to think about bringing the university back to its social mandate of social justice. Relational inquiry, as I've mentioned, Hartrick, Duane and Varco. And Margaret McAllister and transformative learning. So transformative learning, always with the goal of action and doing something. 
um, and doing something to make the world a better place, essentially. Uh, I also really draw on the concept of safer spaces rather than safe. And safer spaces acknowledges that it's, it's really impossible to guarantee safe spaces. But with safer spaces, we can acknowledge that a safe space for one might not be a safe space for another and just try to make it as safe as possible. So I find that a very important concept. And trauma-informed education practice, taking the concept of trauma-informed practice into the field of education really key. And then finally, the, the notion of partnerships and partnering with students. And in our work about bullying, all of our work has been partnered with students. It's a student faculty partnership, which has really been, I think, fantastic. And so there's even a journal, International Journal for Students as Partners, that I had never come across until recently. And I'm just going to ask my colleague Sandra if she would read a quote from one of our students who uh, was talking about the partnership that we had as a group of faculty and students. And um, it is from, um, it's from um, a journal article that's in press and Poon et al is our work and Poon is um, a BSN graduate from the program. So she was an undergraduate program and, and, and she's now taken the lead in this paper. So it's really awesome. Please go ahead, Sandra, thank you. Thanks, Kathy. As a student, it's rare to be not only given opportunity to voice concerns about the greater learning environment, but then an additional opportunity to shift that very environment alongside faculty. How often does curricula for students get written, built and executed by students themselves? I cherish the moments we shared as a group, listening to one another, providing feedback and shaping the workshop together as equals. Wonderful. That's such a beautiful quote. Thank you so much, Sandra, for doing that. That's terrific. So back to what to do. I think another really important thing that we need to do is recognize that bullying and relationships are embedded in more than the interpersonal encounter. Context is key. Institutional power and other systems, systems issues must be explored. And uh, what's recommended by somebody called Hodgkins et al. Hodgkins is a fantastic source if you're looking for a critical review of organizational structure and context and how it influences things like bullying. Um, but we need to begin with the review of our values. That's really key. And that's the place where we need to start. And we need to make a commitment to take action. And I'm going to invite Don to um, get the, we have a two minute video. It's about taking action. It's about uh, a witness to bullying, and it's from a series of vignettes that we're just completing um, here as part of our CRAB project. So can I undo my screen? Just yes, of course, I can stop sharing. Thank you. I'm not hearing any sound. Not getting any audio there, Don. I'm not sure if your volume's up. What about now? Yep. Could you make it a little bit bigger, Don? I actually can't hear it myself. I, I can hear it on mine. So let me just um, I try, I mean, sorry. Can you hear it now? Can you hear it? No. You need to go under your options at the top and share sound. Please. No. Uh, no. Uh, Maybe in the meantime, um, Kathy, if you have that link handy, you could add it in the chat button or the chat box. Where am I supposed to go? Sorry. I'm just going to see if I can just start it. John, if you could try uh, just stopping sharing and then Kathy sure. will yeah, 
I'm not sharing anymore, right? Sorry about that, folks. I knew there'd be a hiccup of some sort. That's just the nature of the game. So thanks for trying, Dan. I know it can be tricky sometimes. Let's just keep our fingers crossed that it might uh, work here. Uh, I don't need, I, I'm not. Oh, enough I, already. You've watched me do it twice and I've watched you do it once. Now you got to go and do it yourself. Just figure it out. You can't come crying to me all the time. I don't feel like I can give safe patient care right now. Oh. All right, I'll come. But you better be ready when I get there. So get your act together, get down there, make sure you've got all the supplies and that you've read the policy and procedure again. I don't have all day. Yes, absolutely. I'll be as quick as I can. Well, you better. You're going to have to pick up the pace if you think you're going to last on this unit. I, no, no buts. I don't have time to babysit you right now. I, I'm not. I, I don't need. I, you have watched me do it twice and I've watched you do it once. I don't see why this is a big deal. All right, I'll come. Just make sure everything's ready when I get there. Make sure you've got all the supplies and you've reviewed the policy and procedure again. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Daphne. No, no buts. I don't have time to babysit you right now. I, I'm not, I, I don't need- I, Enough already. You've watched me do it twice and I've watched you do it once. Now you're going to have to go and do it yourself. Just figure it out. Excuse me. I'm sorry, Daphne, but you really can't speak to Emmett that way. I beg your pardon. I don't want to interfere, but I'm just finding the way that you're speaking to him to be really disrespectful. You know what? I don't have time for this. Just get down there and make sure you're ready when I get there. Make sure that you've got all the supplies and you've reviewed the policy and procedure. Okay, so that was one of a series of vignettes that we've made that will be, avail be available on letsact.ca quite soon. There are a series of interactive videos. We were trying to depict the witness and the role of the witness, first doing nothing, second, not saying anything, but standing beside the target, and then lastly, speaking up. And so happy to answer any questions that you might have about that at the end. I just have one um, final slide that I'd like to go to. Finish up. There we go. So again, just some take home messages and to reiterate that in order to uh, promote respectful interactions between students and faculty, we've got to be trying to prevent, address and eradicate bullying in nursing education. At the individual interpersonal level, that means that we reflect on our own role in bullying. There isn't anyone amongst us who hasn't engaged in behavior that could be conceptualized as bullying. We need to think about that. We, we don't do nothing, we do something, whatever that something might be. Uh, we need to recognize bullying and name it when it occurs. That, it, that in itself can sometimes shift the nature of the interactions that are occurring. We as faculty and students do this all the time, we need to role model respectful communication. And as teachers and as others, as leaders, we need to prioritize relationships. They are the foundation of teaching and learning and nursing. And we need to consider forming partnerships. One participant in McCurtain at Al study said that they would not report bullying again. It was a terrible experience. Management hate complaints and those who complain are the next target. That is a, that is a sentiment that has been repeated in various uh, literature sources and it's certainly a little bit alarming. And then just at the systems, institutions, policies and procedures level, we need to be reviewing the values of our institution. And we don't always do that. We need to be really clear about that. And then we need to set expectations for faculty and students. That's a sort of preventative measure. We need to have clear reporting mechanisms so that if students do experience bullying, 
either in the classroom, in the university or in the clinical area, um, that they know where to go and, and who to go to and what to do. And then we need to have clear processes that address the issue. In terms of education, we need to have content about this in curricula and we need to have professional development for faculty, for clinical instructors. We need to have partnerships with students and with clinical partners, given that the clinical arena is the most commonly cited place uh, for bullying to occur for students. And a final word from uh, Margaret Hodgkins, replace bullying with abuse of power to move from a discourse of behavior to a discourse of power. Really interesting thought, I think, just to leave us all with, I'd like to say thank you for your attention, Gaurav Mahagat and merci. Thank you, Kathy. I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Cheryl Pollard, Dean of Nursing at the University of Virginia's Faculty of Nursing, to present Decoding Collective Trauma, Healing Wounds Within the Academy. And please refer to the webinar uh, webpage for her full bio. Dr. Pollard. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Fleming. I am just delighted to, to be here. I am joining you from uh, Treaty 4 territory in the homeland of, of the Métis. Um, I am just amazed at the interest this has generated from across the country, from east to west, north and, and south. Thank you all so, so much for coming. I am going to uh, share my screen. There we go. Can you all see that all right? Yeah. Perfect. So <clears throat> what my task was to, today with these lovely ladies that I'm presenting with is really to talk about the faculty to faculty experiences with violence within nursing education. So as we start to, to think about what that might look like, I started to wonder about why, why was this happening? Kathy, uh, has Dr. Kathy has done an amazing job in sharing what bullying is like and what some of the definitions are. So building on that work, I'd like us to, to travel down, down the road of, of decoding um, what's happening. This is, this is me just in, in case. So what I'm planning on, on sharing and, and talking, talking with you today about is, is really to decode the collective trauma. What does that mean, um, decoding collective trauma? Collective trauma was originally introduced when it talked about global general experiences, tsunamis, um, earthquakes, um, volcanoes. But I think as we move, move forward, one of the pieces that we will need to, to come to terms with individually and as a a collective nursing group is that we have gone through times that we have never experienced before in, in our lifetimes. And so collectively, we share a common experience. So as I, I speak today, that's what I'm referring to as, as collective trauma. Talk Also talk about uh, the wounds and how we can approach uh, our interactions with each other. A, again, Kathy introduced trauma-informed educational practices. I would like to challenge that idea for us and push that even a little bit further. I'll also talk about uh, and introduce some of the lessons we've learned from our past. And if we can look back, what might our future look like? So I'll share that as, as well. And then as was previously indicated, we'll uh, respond to questions as a group after Sandra has an opportunity uh, to share her information as well. So as we're going into, into this part of the presentation, what's the assumption? The assumption for me is that be behaviors are adaptive. As we start to interact with each other, what we do, we do because we think it's going to work. We do because of some reason. So as we start to think about incivility, bullying, lateral violence, relational violence, I don't believe that people set off or start out to be a bully. I think, I think that people try to do their best 
and are using behaviors that perhaps worked in a, another time, but are no longer uh, adaptive. Um, I just recall the, that old saying around, you know, if you keep doing the same thing, why would you expect a different result? I know I haven't captured that quite right, but I think you get the gist of, of that. So let's think about incivility. You know, what, I've, what I hear over and, and over again is that's incivil, stop it. You know, treat each other more nicely. Just stop. If we work from the premise that incivility is a behavior and it's a behavior that we're reacting to something, you know, are we trying to protect ourselves with being incivil? You know, we hear that hurt people hurt. So how does that link into incivility? As we start to think about how we would provide care to other individuals that have been traumatized, I remember working, working with students and one of, our, one of our students, it's like, well, they just got to quit doing that. Well, that, that's fine, you know, we can quit doing that, but they're doing it for a reason. And what are we going to replace it with? You know, if you think about uh, sub substance misuse, people use substances for a reason. Nobody, nobody starts off with wanting to, to be an addict. Nobody starts off with wanting substances to interfere with their relationships. So if you get rid of the behaviors, what's going to take its place? I'd like us to just start to imagine that incivility is actually behavior that we're trying to adapt to something with. So what, what are some options instead of incivility? Well, I think what one of the pieces that we have to understand is actually where does this come from? There's lots of work in, in the relational literature, whether that's from Don and Varco, Mark, Martin Buber, um, Wendy Austin, uh, Vanjie Burgum with the relational ethics pieces, that this is, is the, the ability to see the face of, of the other. So that's, those are words of um, Bauman and, and Buber. So it's really around objectification. Why are we able to object, objectify? Why do we objectify? You know, so it's whether it's incivility and othering. So as we think about incivility as an adaptive behavior that's gone awry, depending on, on what we want, um, why does this happen? I shared the image here from the Canadian Nurses uh, Association, and I just think it, it's such a powerful, powerful image. When I look into the eyes of the, the nurses in this image, I, I see exhaustion. I see people who are, are tired. Um, my daughter was recently admitted into, into hospital and one of the, she's 12, one of the pieces that I was absolutely, I don't know if the word's dumbfounded or I was just absolutely moved. The nurses that were working with our, our family, they did, they did their job with, with excellence. They did everything they needed to do but it felt like, like they were empty. It felt like there was a, a blank. You know, when, when someone sneaks, sneaks up behind you and you can, they haven't said anything, but you can feel that someone's there, you feel the energy or you feel the, the presence. You couldn't feel that with the nurses when we were in hospital. Um, in emergency, people are exhausted and they're, they're done. Um, I saw examples just observing um, demonstrations of, of incivility, whether that was through actions or words, uh, <clears throat> or in fact, where assessments were, were taking place. So why, why would people act incivilly? Why, why are they feeling empty? Certainly there's, there's personality characteristics and those are the intra pieces that Kathy talked about. 
potential feelings of, of inadequacy. Certainly the imposter syndrome um, comes into my life from time to time. Um, personal ambitions, you know, these are my goals, I'm going to get them and no matter, no matter what. COVID has also really highlighted the uncertainty. I don't know what my job's going to look like. I don't know what my patients are going to be like. And then what are my responsibilities going to be? You know, when you're pulled out of, um, when, you're, when you're pulled out of a med search unit and, and are put in ICU, who knows what's going to happen? All of these things are reasons as to why people are, are behaving in, in civil, why violence becomes an option in our behavioral repertoire. Certainly there's, there's space factors, blurring of boundaries between home and work, and then the lack of reciprocal understanding uh, and respect. This one for me, all of these are, are absolutely loaded, but this one for me really speaks to some of our responsibilities as, as treaty people. It speaks to how we are wanting to, to move forward and, and engage. And it's that reciprocalness that we are starting to, to understand and explore a little more. Certainly when, um, with relational ethics, as we speak about mutual engagement, that's the reciprocal piece that there needs, that there needs to be benefits for both individuals. Um, there's also, I threw up in, in here, because what presentation doesn't have a few little quotes in here? So I threw this in here uh, for us as, as well. One of the pieces that was, was super interesting for, for me is that the age and incivility scores showed a negative correlation. There was also a correlation between those who were, who were single, had, had higher incivility scores than those who were, who were married. There weren't good explanations as to why that, why these things occurred. But again, part of what I wonder about is if the behaviors are adaptive, what is it that we're adapting to? As we start to, to think about nursing as it's occurred over the, the last 40 years, um, thinking about bullying, and bullying has been with us for decades. So if bullying is with us for decades, it wouldn't still be here if we didn't get some benefits from it. So as we think about, about uh, relational violence within the academy, how, really, how historically has it represented itself? In the 1980s to 1990s, certainly there, there were, um, there were uh, gender issues. So when you look at this, at this table, the, ante the antecedent is really what, what are the basis for this? How, why would, would incivility be coming up? The manifestation is how does how do you see in civil behaviors? Response is related to how what is the response that you would get either from a manager, from a, a supervisor, an administrator, or even from yourself. And the impact is how does that affect me as, as a person? So in the um, 80s to 90s, certainly there was lots of um, gender related issues that were, were coming up. Um, males were often told that, you know, males don't belong in nursing, don't belong in nursing. So you just move along and you get yourselves a real job and you leave this for the people that know how to care. That is an example of, of bullying. The, the manifestation being physical was around physical traits. In the literature, it also describes, I didn't want to make that mistake because my hands would get slapped. And so there was that physical contact. How did individuals who were bullied respond? They responded by feeling alone and abandoned. They felt unassisted, um, ignored, and their motivation just dropped. In the 1990s to 2000s, it was really around organizational culture. And Kathy, thank you for doing such a nice job describing power. 
and the influence and the impact power has on on our relationships. So within the 90s to the 2000s, what um, Harton and the colleagues described is that really it was around organizational culture and behavior of, of other nurses. It was the old nurses versus the new nurses. As some of you will, will recall, this is also the time where there was some traction around moving nursing schools from hospitals, institutions, into a different kind of institution. Now nursing went from a responsibility of health to a responsibility of advanced education. So there really became the tensions between diploma versus degree, hospital versus post-secondary. And we also started to move from, from caring being just something that we do with our patients and our clients. So again, it was un, unspoken, um, but you could feel it palpable as, as relationships evolved. And quite frankly, the impact, if people, <coughs> excuse me, people would move, people would leave, people would vote with their feet and move on from jobs. Well, about five more minutes, Cheryl. Well, I better get going. I better get a move on then. Okay, thanks, Don. So the biggest piece in, in, this, in this slide for me is we, we talk about what's next, what's next. As we go through, you know, we've been through gender, we've been through power, we've used um, and experienced pressure, do more, do more. And then with culture, you know, getting decreased lengths of stay, wanting or having increased acuity of patients. What is going to happen next for us? If we do nothing, the, my belief, um, mine and my colleague Annette Marsh, our beliefs are that the antecedent is really around collaboration. We're trying to develop inclusive communities where our members feel safe and possess a strong sense of, of empowerment and belonging. That, that comes up as we start to other and objectify. People are, are disempowered and the impact is really around isolation and hopelessness. The, um, the mutual engagement just really isn't able to happen. I'm gonna skip over this slide. So as we decide what we are going to do around incivility, bullying, lateral violence, please, please think about the choices ours to make. The choices ours is to do we want um, this to continue or do we want something different? But again, remember that it is because we, there are some advantages to being in civil that people continue to do this. The second assumption for me is that all of us have experienced trauma and we've experienced trauma from seeing it, from being engaged, being, um, just I wrote this down, being a, a target, rather than a victim and certainly experiencing all of the historical whoops, trauma that we've experienced. My third assumption is really that the premise of trauma informed approach in education is supportive and that it is with a nurturing and healing relationship that we can all contribute to a healing process. But how do we start those healing processes? Trauma informed practices are one of those. So as we look at um, potential avenues to engage in this kind of practice, the very first thing we need to do is notice. We need to notice that we have all experienced trauma, how we have been triggered, how we individually experience trauma is different, but all of us collectively have experienced something. We are at a crossroads. This is my chicken who's deciding whether or not they're going to cross the road. We're at a crossroads here. So what I would like to invite you to do is to notice. When you start to notice yourself saying, I'm tired, I'm done. Seriously, listen to me. You know, if you would only communicate better, we'd get along much more easily. You know, or maybe they're out to get me. How long is this going to take? Or I just wish this was over. How many times have you heard that? When is COVID over? I'm done. 
So when you notice yourself saying those things to saying those things, I invite you to stop. I invite you to, to stop. Ask yourself, what are you experiencing and where are you feeling it? Emotional literacy, when we are thinking about incivility as, as a reaction, emotional literacy will really help us find, us find our way through. And to do that, we need to understand that the situation, something's happening. That's the threat that we feel. What sort of thoughts are, are coming up? Do we feel threatened? Emotion, are we happy? Are we afraid? Are we scared? And then our behavior. So my fourth assumption and I personally, I think it's the most important assumption is that we are do all doing the very best we can. We all have experienced very, very challenging circumstances and our behaviors are adaptive. They not, may not be good. They may not be healthy, but we do try them because they're adaptive. So we're doing the best we can. Thanks for the five minutes, Don. And at this point, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it back over. Thank you very much, Dr. Pollard. Our final presentation today is by Dr. Sandra Davidson, Dean of Nursing at the University of Calgary. And again, please refer to the webinar webpage for her full bio. Her presentation is entitled, Setting the Table for Civility, Strategies for Administrators and Leaders in Nursing Education. And thank you, uh, please go ahead, Dr. Davidson. Well, thanks so much, uh, Jessica, for the introduction. And thanks so much to my colleagues um, for, for setting this final port, part up so well. It's amazing how our, our um, thoughts are, are aligning yet not duplicating. So I, I hope to offer um, and extend um, what my colleagues have already uh, shared with you. And you know, to Cheryl's point in looking, we have a choice, we're at that crossroads. I really agree with that. And we can continue to perpetuate the patterns um, that have led to bullying and violence, or we can look for different ways of being and work on how to, to do be different. Um, so I, I think there'll be some resonance with, with what you've heard previously and where I'm going to take us. And I'm, I'm re, I, my goal in all of this was uh, to represent the focus on administration and leadership in nursing. Um, and uh, so that's the lens that I'm bringing to this um, particularly. So, you know, I, re I really believe that um, leaders, whether they're informal or formal, um, and there are both, leaders are everywhere, um, that the role that we have in organizations is to really set the table. And this speaks to what my colleagues have, have termed uh, culture. And so when we're looking at, I think we did a really nice job today of, you know, Kathy starting with individuals, the student to student, student to faculty, um, and, and then, you know, the peer-to-peer the -peer, um, work that, and the, the, the trauma that uh, Cheryl talked about. And now I'm looking at it with this lens of culture and as an organization, what can we do collectively? And how, as leaders, do we start to set a table um, and an intention for the culture that we want to create and we want to thrive there? And you know, I, I think Kathy's point about um, values is really, really important. And you know, it's sometimes we think of it as, as kind of a throwaway that it's something we need for accreditation or that we need to have it in a strategic plan, but really bringing those values to life is a really important piece of, of how we behave together and how we um, move through our days collectively. So here we have this beautiful table set. And, and this is, I think every leader's goal is to lay a, a bountiful, um, a bountiful table uh, for all of our colleagues in the organization with so many tools on the table um, and beautiful settings and comfortable chairs. I mean, this is the ideal and uh, I'm using it as a metaphor, but thinking about how do we create that, that safer, inclusive environment um, and what are the tools that we have or the perspectives or lenses that we can use to bring that into being. Oops. There we go. Um, and so it really does, in my mind, matter how you set the table. And um, a, a lot of my work has, has been in 
um, leveraging appreciative inquiry, strengths-based um, approaches, positive psychology. Uh, there's a lot of these things that have their roots in positive psychology. Relational leadership. I know we've already mentioned relational inquiry. This is the leadership corollary of that. You know, how do we develop organizational resilience? And on an individual level, how do we get better at having crucial conversations and and having disrupting maybe habitual patterns that lead to, to violence or incivility and replacing them with, with tools that we can have better conversations. So these are these are what I'm imagining as those 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 chopsticks and 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 the the chargers and, and the forks and knives on that table are these tools that we can use to rethink about reframe what we're doing within organizations and how we're being together. So just a, a quick shout out for uh, positive psychology here. Again, really, it's it's a, an offshoot of psychology that is, by all standards, in its infancy. You know, we've really been looking at these ideas in the last decade, maybe 20 years. Um, but there's a good amount of, of research out there. And this is where I, I think, um, and I actually wrote a paper once that was called... Um, hard science, soft skills. And this is what, that's what I think about when I think about positive psychology and some of these, some of these um, attributes that we all have our, at our fingertips, if we choose to, to develop them and harness them. And this has a, a basis in biology that, you know, it really is our hormones. And we know the stress, the negative stress hormone cortisol has an absolutely catastrophic effects on us. And you think about um, the, the trauma and, and the incivility and how that triggers cortisol and doing some of these pieces here triggers a different kind of hormone that allows us, it actually opens up our brain so that we can have better conversations and make connections with other people. Um, and, and I think one of the more, more important pieces here is that self harnessing self-compassion for ourselves. You know, as, as Cheryl said, we've all been in situations where we are having a bad day and we say something that we shouldn't have. Um, and, and, you know, having that compassion for ourselves and those around us um, and moving forward in, in a constructive sort of way. So uh, just some, some reading, I, I wanted to give you tools and, and thoughts to take away with um, from this presentation. So a couple of pieces for myself as a leader that I really draw on, and, and I know there's some folks from my faculty that are here today. It was great to see your, your names in the list. Um, Dare to Lead is, is really focusing on Brene Brown's work, love Brene Brown, but the foundation and, and what her research brings to the table is really, and I love the byline there, it says it all, brave work. It, it, you need to be brave to do something different, to make a change, to stand up, to, to do something, um, and tough conversations. Um, and we need to bring our whole heart. So mo both of my colleagues talked about this concept of othering, and I almost put a slide on othering, so I'm glad I didn't because it would be repetitive. But how do we move towards connection rather than depersonalization and othering. And, and I think Brene's work gives a lot of instruction for leaders around that. Likewise, Sean Acor, if you haven't seen his TED talk, it's Google it and watch it. Um, he's, he's a positive psychologist and is talking about when we harness those, those attributes of positive psychology, we actually do better at our studies, at our work, whatever it is, and we're, we're more connected and more healthy. So important things from an organizational perspective. So the other tool that I use um, is reframing our organizations. And, and, you know, we often think of organizations as, you know, hierarchies, um, structures. Um, the, another kind of metaphor that is common out there is organization as a machine or organization as a living thing. I like to think as organizations as conversations. And these, it's these, it, these ripple effects of conversations that lead to conversations that lead to conversations. And I have the, the, um, the iron fence here because you can see that there's a recurring pattern, right? And so sometimes our ways of talking and our patterns of being feel so recalcitrant, right? That, that reminds me of this iron thing that there's patterns that are moving us through um, because this is the way we do it, or this is the way we, we approach it when somebody reports incivility and, and we feel locked in. And I think the the thing that works for me um, is to notice that. And I know Cheryl, you had the slide about noticing with the collective trauma. And I have a slide later that kind of builds on that. Um, but 
doing something in my mind is changing the conversation and just not doing what you habitually would do, which perpetuates more of the same that my colleagues have talked about. Um, but how, what are those subtle ways that we can disrupt that structure that can sometimes feel so stifling? And, and be that positive deviant, to do something different, to take a chance, to be courageous and, and uh, change the conversation. And it's so interesting, um, just to, to illustrate how um, hard it is sometimes. I, I've been Dean in um, the faculty here for just about four years. Um, and you know we have processes, and, and my colleagues talked about processes of, of um, post-secondary academia, as well as the, the background of nursing and, and some of the, the collision of those two structures. And there's conversations around tenure and promotion that happen. And so I have up in the corner there to remind myself, there's this, there's, there's, I've uncovered it. It's not just in at University of Calgary, it's other universities as well. There's this myth of tenure and promotion that it's this big, scary thing. And it's a negative thing. And so many people get so wound up about it because this it feels do or die. And you get all kinds of weird advice um, when you're pre-tenure about whatever you do, don't do this or make sure you do that. And um, it's, it's, it's laden with this fear and, and this you know, judgment of our peers about our work. And so what I've tried really hard to do um, from a leadership perspective is to change that narrative, um, giving folks the support, making it doable, um, coaching folks along the way that are coming up for tenure so, so that they're going to shine. And, and, and I, I'm trying to, and we have conversations in our tenure and promotion around celebrating the great work and the success that our colleagues are doing and elevating it from that positive experience rather than this negative judgy kind of piece. Um, so that's just an example of changing that myth and, and interrupting that narrative, right? And, and changing it with something that's more positive and emancipatory um, and supportive. So um, the other piece that I was going to, somebody actually wrote a book <laughs> that has this title. And I know we don't talk about that in, in, in nursing. This is outside of, of nursing and healthcare in, in other types of organizations, uh, corporate organizations. But just an example that I, I thought was, it came up yesterday. Um, the TUCFA um, refers to uh, the University of Calgary Faculty Association. And um, I, I we're in the process of renewing our, um, our, our handbook, our faculty handbook for merit and tenure and promotion and all those kinds of things. And we had this wonderful collaborative process whereby we had uh, TUCFA members, our faculty, um, take the lead and engage their peers in conversations around what does that benchmark look like for promotion, for tenure, um, and, and, and how do we want that to be in nursing? And I, I was so um, heartened to see that my colleagues had had this, this flow of collegiality, that that was an important value, an important way of being in, part, in our faculty. And so it was recognized in kind of our, our um, progression that being a good colleague and, and, and participating in, the, in what was going on around us um, was an important piece um, in moving to, towards promotion and tenure. And so when our initial draft went to the faculty association, um, the faculty association took great um, exception to the fact that we had included collegiality as a benchmark for tenure and promotion. Um, and it was very much in it, it struck me because I was practicing getting this talk ready at the same time. It's like, oh my gosh, here our faculty is trying to institute collegiality, which I think is akin to this no mm -hmm rule, right? We want to make sure we're we're retaining and and promoting and honoring those um, that are contributing and you know are are a vibrant part of our of the culture we want to create and not doing a disservice to it by being out for themselves and only themselves and, and not, um, you know, making us all better as a whole. So that was our attempt to, to bring collegiality into the, into the handbook and, and Tukva really pushed back. Um, so I still have to have that conversation with Tukva because I just got that feedback. Um, but it, I mean, it, it's, uh, it, this represents the value of the Faculty of Nursing, and this is important to, to the TUCPA members that are in the faculty, and, and so we need to have a conversation there, a crucial conversation. 
All right. Um, speaking of crucial conversations, if you don't know of these two books, these I, I love the work um, that this group does. Uh, Granny and his colleagues, um, they're they're in their third and fourth editions now. But this is really it's it's based on um, observational and interviews of of folks that have are really good at holding hard conversations in organizations and they distill it down into practices and principles that will help us all to be better communicators when the stakes are high when emotions are high and and moving us into um, having better conversations overall so I offer it as a reference for you if you're not familiar with it and one of the pieces here that I just love, and this goes back to the pattern thing. So Joseph Grenny, who's who's the primary um, author of, of this, he says, if you are stuck relationally or organizationally, it's because there is a conversation that you are not having or not having well. And so I think about that in terms of the perpetuation of, of bullying and, and horizontal violence, whatever it is. And you know, are we there because we're not having the right kinds of conversations or not holding them well? And how can we get better at having those difficult conversations? And I have some other food for thought for you. So um, Cheryl, this is this is my version of, of what you talked about in that trauma-informed care. And this is actually work of Otto Scharmer, not a nurse, um, but an organizational theorist from MIT. And what I wanna draw your attention to is that he's got these two principles, these two, let's call them patterns, um, and a, a, a pattern of presencing and a pattern of absencing, um, or absencing could be, um, you know, uh, there's another term for it that's that's escaping me at the moment. Hold on. Uh, anti-space. So the space is presencing and anti-space is absencing. And so um, as, as I've talked about, this is, I think we want more of what's at the top and less of what's at the bottom. Um, but if you if you just look at that bottom and the absencing, this is this is the pattern of of blinding, not noticing. Right. And, and Cheryl just said that noticing is the first part. And that's reflected up here in this seeing. This is an organizational kind of con construct for how we can create um, more vibrant, um, inclusive cultures. Right. So the blinding, the desensing, the absencing, this is where we other people. Um, and we and, and sometimes I find this as a leader and I was I was talking to some of the faculty about this and getting ready for this presentation and what should I include. And it's interesting how othering has recently shown up. Um, and I think COVID and being on Zoom has really um, made othering um, more prevalent. It's easier to other someone when you just see them in a little square um, than if they're sitting beside you. And you can, as you, as, um, as you said, uh, Cheryl, you can feel their presence. Um, and so sometimes I, I've heard um, situations where um, administrators are othered because we're referred to as our title, not the person Sandra. So I, there was an example where there was a meeting of faculty and I wasn't there. The story came to me afterwards, um, but it was like, oh no, the Dean would never let us do that. And it's this, this blanket statement of that I would, you know, the power structures, the Dean, the power of the Dean would never let us do that. And, and you know, the others called into question and kind of said, well, you know, I, I know Sandra and she she wouldn't not be open to a conversation. And, and so how, how that's something that we can all do is when we see that othering and, and the absencing, how do we deep repersonalize, repersonalize what's happening there um, and say, you know, I, I know this person, you know, we, we taught together two semesters ago and they were very reasonable. And, and so what's going on there? And that gets to this open heart, open mind and open will. And, and I think curiosity is such a key um, inflection point that instead of being uh, fearful or moving from a place of fear and anger, remaining curious and open to what's going on for other people that are maybe um, having challenges and, and um, perpetuating bullying or negative, negative um, patterns of, of behavior. Um, so for me, this is really helpful in thinking about how we move forward organizationally. And at least seeing it and naming it is the first thing that um, helps us to reframe it. So the other work that I wanted to bring in is just Brene Brown's work. And that's the columns you see here of the daring leadership and the armored leadership. And I think it lines up really well with the U space. So this is going back to what I just showed you. The, the U space is, is this yellow one. And then the anti space is the, the lower blue one. 
And um, so I, I think, you know, if we're looking at leadership and, and some of Brene's work, if you just look at this list of armored leadership, this is that quintessential power over and um, control and hierarchy and positional power that maybe I think we've all been a part of these institutions because um, just like you, we teach how we were taught, we lead how we've been led, which isn't always good. And so we say, well, this must be the way to do it unless we actually um, find and educate ourselves with better ways of being. So, you know, um, I, I, I won't read that all, but you can see it there. And then just quickly look at this daring leadership. And the thing that I wanted to point out here is putting, we've talked about power throughout this presentation, these presentations. And instead of using power over, how do we start to think about using power with, power to, and power within? And reframing our conception of power that we are stronger together and it is that relational connection that gives us the power um, to overcome some of, of those things that we want to overcome. Um, so I, I think that this is a really nice rubric for thinking about stepping into difficult conversations, leading with our hearts and, and harnessing positive psychology that will help us um, become healthier as individuals and as organizations. Yes, and so, just a couple of minutes left. Yeah, I'm almost done. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> I love this picture because, you know, we, we, I had the vision, the grand vision of the beautifully laid table on the beach at the beginning. But I love this quote by Arthur Ashe, start where you are, use what you have and do what you can. We can all do that. And I love this picture here because it just speaks to me of, you know, they don't have a lot. They don't even have a table big enough. But gosh, they can throw another blanket on the floor and make space for everyone. And it just strikes me as this beautiful inclusivity. Um, everybody has a place at the table. Um, and it might be a meager, um, you know, napkin and a, a fork and a, a knife and a, a, a vessel, but they're setting the table with what they have. We can all do that. Um, and sometimes, you know, eat, leaders eat last. Um, we, what leaders do, formal leaders and informal leaders, we set the culture. That's part of the work that we do in leadership, which is different from administration and management. Um, but Simon Sinek's book, Leaders Eat Last, is a really great um, resource for learning how to lead in this way, whatever role you happen to be in. So sometimes, and I hear it is, you know, leaders do the dishes. And this is for me is walking that talk. And modeling um, what we want um, to create more of in our organizations. And so sometimes it's having the leader visibly engage in that hard conversation or model um, you know, an apology if something was said um, in anger or wrong or whatever it is, but being um, modeling the way um, is, is basically what that is. And in the service of others, right? So I want to end with this. Um, and this is Bowman and Deal, who are organizational theorists. It's, it, it's old, but I go back to it time and time again. And this is the value of that reframing. A mess can be defined as both a troublesome situation and a group of people who eat together. And I hope in nursing education, we can focus more on creating the people who eat together and collaborate and, and create safer environments rather than the troublesome situation we find ourselves in. Um, just a preview of coming attractions. This is a really great book that I'm reading currently, and it really takes into account the context of what COVID has done to us and the pandemic and how our work has been disruptive and what that might mean for leadership and organizations going forward. So it, uh, it's a great read. Um, and I will stop there. Thanks, everyone. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Davidson, and all of our presenters uh, for an excellent first half of our session. So I'll just be stopping the recording.